This talk will be about pros and cons of genetically modified fish in aquaculture. And I will have emphasis on Atlantic salmon and Norwegian conditions. First, I would like to talk a little bit about genetic modifications and what it is. And what it means is altering the genetic makeup of an organism. And changes in an organism's genetic makeup also happens naturally. And this is the driving force of evolution. Where you have spontaneous uh, mutations that uh, occur. And this could give uh, no effect at all. Or it could give rise to a negative trait or a beneficial trait. And if it's a beneficial trait, uh, this can be selected for either naturally or sexually. Uh, however, uh, when we norm what we normally mean when we talk about genetic modifications is not evolution, but man-made alterations to a genome. And the most classical example of that is selective breathing. And breathing is, is evolution fast forward where you select for desirable traits in organisms and you let these uh, organisms who have these trait, uh, traits mate for the coming generations. Uh, a well-known example of this is the creation of all the different races of dogs we have today from wild uh, wolves. And it uh, has also been used a lot for centuries in in farming, where you select um, for uh, animals that produce more offspring, that grow faster, have higher meat quality, and so on. So this has been done both for fish and for cattle and um, other species, a lot of plant species particularly. So, but uh, breathing is a slow process and spontaneous mu mutations happen often, but it might not give a positive trait. So what uh, some started to do that was they started to induce mutagenesis. Uh, that is to induce the mutation frequency and speed up the evolution process. And there are several methods that was developed for this. For instance, the use of, of chemicals and radiations, uh, both will increase the number of uh, mutations. And then if um, a beneficial trait occur, then they could select uh, and continue classical breathing afterwards. Well, this uh, is uh, a random process. It's not specific. But as um, time went on, we developed biotechnology and bioengineering, which is what most people think of when they hear genetic modifications. And these uh, technologies allow a lot more specific uh, mutations to occur in, in the genome where you can both cause uh, insertions and deletions and, uh, and you can alter uh, a gene or a sequence and you can also knock it down so that the, the gene will not be expressed. And from, from the, around 2000 there were new improved technologies that were developed and that could manipulate the genomes directly. And example of these are the zinc finger nucleases, the talons, and the CRISPR. And CRISPR in particular was uh, um, particularly attractive because it's got a very simple design and very high efficiency in producing targeted mutations. And this system uh, allows for multiple specific genomic modifications to be, be performed simultaneously. So this is uh, much cheaper, much faster, and with uh, increased specificity and efficiency. However, it, uh, it may come with some side effects. Um, 
there could be unintended point mutations, deletions, insertions, inversions, or translocations in the DNA. And maybe the treatment affected many genes or another gene than the one we intended. And uh, it could also lead to unforeseen effects of the modification. Maybe the, the proteins made from the gene had functions that we were unaware of so that adding a gene could give unforeseen consequences in the animal or in the plant or in the organism. And the same way with the destroying a gene, if we destroyed a gene, maybe these proteins had some other crucial functions than we expected. And this could affect the uh, organism's development or health. As a food source, maybe the altered protein introduced a new allergen or could be toxic for instance, or, um, uh, or new diseases could emerge. So there could be potential side effects to uh, this engineering, even though it's quite specific. So then I will re um, start talking about fish aquaculture. And aquaculture is breeding, hatching, raising and harvesting of fish. So basically, it's farming in water. And that can be indoors and outdoors, in, in tanks and ponds and rivers and lakes and fjords and the open sea. And it can be in both open and closed sea pens. There are many forms of aquaculture and fish are bred for many purposes, such as fish for stocking in uh, rivers, or lakes to help recover declining population or to support recreational fishing. Um, it can be for the aquarium industry, both for private homes and professional aquariums. It can be laboratory fish for science and of course fish for food and also fish associated with the food industry such as cleaner fish, which I will come back to later. In this lecture, the focus will be mainly on aquaculture fish used for food and also mainly fish in the sea. So, uh, fish aquaculture has a long history. It is thought that uh, local Aboriginal Australian people in the southwestern Victoria, in Australia, may have raised short finned eels as early as 6,500 years ago. And in China, aquaculture of carp has been pursued at least for 2,400 years, and tilapia in Egypt for about 4,000 years. In Norway, the first aquaculture was of cod, and it started in the 1880s in Arndal in Danvik. However, large-scale aquaculture was in Norway from the 1960s, um, especially with salmon, and from the 80s with cod. And now the productions are in the thousands of tons per year. So worldwide, uh, in 2016, there were 369 different fish species farmed commercially worldwide. And about 50% of human consumption of fish are derived from aquaculture. And this is expected to increase to about 70% uh, um, by 2030, according to the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, or the FAO. The most common species used for aquaculture are by far the carps uh, and you have the grass carp and the big head carp and the common carp here and also the silver carp is uh, a very popular aquaculture fish and then there are the tilapias and the catfishes and the salmonids here is the atlantic salmon also rainbow trout and so on are very popular species 
in Norway, uh, the most popular species by far is the Atlantic salmon. We produce about 1.3 million tons a year. Uh, we also have a high production of rainbow trout, of halibut, and Atlantic cod. And also the, the lumpfish and the uh, balan wrasse are popular fishes in aquaculture. But these are not mainly used for, um, these last two species are not mainly used for aquaculture, uh, for food but indirectly because they are used as cleaner fish for uh, salmon laos uh, for the salmon. And before I continue, I just want to show you the, the babies of the, um, of the um, uh, lumpfish. Because uh, the lumpfish here has um, the most cutest babies in the world. <laughs> it's just a digression, but I just wanted to uh, to show you that before we move on. So uh, now I want to talk a little bit of why do we need fish aquaculture. And the thing is that fish are scarce. Uh, we have been exploiting the environment for a long time and many species worldwide are in decline. So uh, to give a little image of it, like in the distant past, there were a few people and plenty of fish in the sea, so to speak. And uh, the catching of the fish was sort of balanced to what everyone needed. Whereas today we are a lot of people and fish are in decline. And we use super trawlers and we have lots of machines and stuff that help us fish a lot more than we actually need and create a lot of waste and this uh, affects the um, population of fish worldwide and according to the IUCN there are now 2,721 threatened fish species and it, ex it is expected that um, we need aquaculture to preserve species that are not only in high demand uh, for food, but also for, for others to be protected so that we can leave the wild fish uh, alone. There are um, several advantages of uh, aquaculture. One is the protection of wild stocks that I just spoke about. And of course it gives um, a stable food source it's a, a reliable source of affordable animal protein. And uh, global demand of fish is expected to double by 2050. And farmed fish can help uh, meet that need. Aquaculture can reduce certain types of uh, environmental impact and increase some aspects of animal welfare. I say it like that because uh, aquaculture industry certainly has their own problems with animal welfare and environmental impact that I will come back to, but in other areas they can be beneficial. Uh, for instance, um, harvesting fish in culture, in aquaculture, is easier and this can reduce some environmental impact, uh, like demersal trawling and dredging that you use in, for wild fishing uh, can inflict devastating damage upon the seabed, and this can affect entire ecosystems. You see the trawling here destroys the sea, uh, the sea floor, and also trawling can be used uh, that um, uh, frequently also causes uh, bycatch, which kills and wounds marine mammals and other fish species and sea turtles and seabirds and invertebrates and sponges and corals and what have you and this can deplete uh, wildlife stocks so uh, and also it, uh, aquaculture can have some socio-economical advantages uh, such as increasing local jobs and drive scientific knowledge and technology 
So there are also a lot of challenges with aquaculture and I will list some of the main challenges here and come back to most of them in more detail during the rest of this talk. So you have the environmental impact that I was uh, mentioning uh, at the previous slide. And the most, um, one of the highest problems in aquaculture is that of escapees, uh, where you have fish, uh, farmed fish that escapes from the pens and interacts with wildlife. And um, uh, these uh, escapees can lead to genetic introgression and affect ecosystems. It can also, uh, the aquaculture in itself can affect wildlife behavior as aquaculture has been shown to alter migration patterns, for instance, or wild stocks, and it can attract predators such as marine mammals and birds to the cages. And also the, the industry creates a lot of waste and these uh, waste include chemicals, antibiotics, pesticides, dead fish, excess food uh, and so on that affects the surrounding environment and can affect the, the local ecosystems. Another problem that is um, in, uh, in aquaculture is that of precocious uh, sexual maturity where you have fish becoming sexually mature at a much younger age than they would normally uh, in the wild. This early maturation is most likely a combined effect of the absence of predators inside the pens and that they had steady access to food. Um, there are several disadvantages uh, with the fish becoming uh, mature early. And one is decreased growth uh, and uh, decreased fillet quality. And it can affect animal welfare because uh, the precocious sexual maturity leads to uh, immunosuppression, which makes the animal more susceptible to disease and it can increase mortality. And of course, less meat and sick fish uh, leads to an economical loss uh, economic loss for the farmer. And the last thing I want to mention here is the potential of genetic um, pollution, where you have fish that spawn inside the pens, such as, for instance, Atlantic cod. When they get sexually mature, they spawn inside the pen, and this could spread the larva and the eggs outside the pen and uh, uh, into the wildlife populations and lead to genetic integration. And the industry has a lot of uh, welfare problems. And uh, for instance, uh, there is a lot of handling and high stock densities and constraining conditions, which is can create a lot of stress. And the animals have increased sus uh, susceptibility to pathogens parasites and diseases, and they have a lack of natural behavior, such as um, they cannot hunt or uh, perform migrations, for instance, like a, a salmon would normally do, would migrate between the, uh, to the rivers. And the environment is uh, monotone. Uh, there is a lack of environmental enrichment, which could affect their brain development. So um, there are quite a lot of challenges in the animal welfare department for, for this industry. Uh, the last uh, um, subject that I want to talk about is fish feed, um, especially for, um, for carnivorous fish uh, that eat other fish. Uh, this can create, this costs a lot of resources and, um, and providing food for such species uh, may put pressure on wild fish stocks that are used to supply fish meal and fish oil for aqua feed. And uh, so that can um, affect the environment and uh, 
biodiversity and the uh, stocks of wild fish. So the main question of this talk is if these problems uh, that are here, uh, if they can be solved through genetic modifications. And I don't know the, the de definite answer to that, but uh, we will try to look at it, into it during the rest of this talk. So first I would like to talk a little about um, Atlantic salmon. Here it is, it's very nice. The salmon salad. And I will be using um, the salmon as the main example during the rest of this talk. The salmon is the most commercially valuable aquaculture fish species in the world. And even though it's not produced in such high rates as, for instance, the carps are, uh, they are, uh, they uh, earn a lot more money. They are much more valuable. So this is a, a very big business and um, there's a lot of money involved. And uh, this species also just serves as a good example uh, because there's a lot of research going on um, on this species, probably because of its uh, value and uh, also a lot of lobbying, uh, mind you. So the largest aquaculture industry uh, in the world is Norway. Uh, no, the largest salmon aquaculture industry. We produced uh, in 2019, produced 1.3 million metric tons, and this was worth over $8 billion. And we've had commercial scale aquaculture of salmon since the 1960s. And up until recently, there has been normal selective breeding for growth rate and disease resistance and timing of sexual maturation and fillet characteristics. Whereas today, many genetically engineered salmons already exist. This is also why this is a good example for uh, this talk. There is even one genetically uh, um, modified salmon that, is on, that has been available for consumers since 2017. And that is the Aqua Advantage. And that uh, you can buy it on the, in several countries, including Canada and the United States. So if you ever go there, you can uh, taste a genetically modified salmon. So the Aqua Advantage, the genetically modified salmon, was developed by Aqua Bounty Technologies in 1989. So it's been around for a long time so it took a long time to get it um, approved for for um, for the market and the approval was first i think in 2015 and then it was available in stores from 2017. so what they did with this salmon when they they made this this uh, genetically modified salmon was that they took uh, a growth hormone uh, regulating gene from Pacific chinook salmon and they took an antifreeze promoter from the ocean pout and they micro-injected that into salmon eggs. And the reason they did that is uh, um, uh, because wild salmon, its growth cycle, it slows down when water is cold in the winter, but when it has an antifreeze promoter, uh, get, that gives it tolerance for cold water and it can grow all year. So instead of just growing uh, in the summer, you get a fish that grows all year because of uh, this modification. And here it is. So here is the Aqua Advantage uh, versus a conventional uh, Atlantic salmon. And these are the same age. So uh, the fish grows to market size in about 16 to 18 months instead of three years that it normally takes for conventional um, Atlantic salmon. It will not grow any larger than conventional fish, fish but it will grow uh, just faster. So it takes about half the time. And moreover, it uses 25% less feed than today's 
Atlantic salmon to get to that size. So more meat for less feed and less uh, time, this can feed more people and also spare the environment and, and resources. Uh, the same company has developed uh, also growth enhancement for trout and tilapia, but I will not go into that now. So now I will start to talk about, go more into depth about some of the challenges in the aquaculture industry. First, I like to talk about the um, escape, uh, escapees. That are uh, these were the fish that escaped from the sea pens, and this is a major concern for the aquaculture industry because these fish end up in open waters or in rivers. In um, the Directorate of Fisheries here in Norway reported that there were over 30,000 escapees in 2020 and 290,000 in 2019, and these numbers have been fluctuating. Um, over the past years, but it's a lot of fish, and 99% of those are salmon. And salmon are good uh, jumpers, you know, they have to jump up the river to <laughs> uh, when they are going to mate. But um, uh, it's been reported that uh, these escapees from sea farms can lead to unwanted genetic introgression into the wild populations. And for instance, Glover et al. did a, uh, um, a study where they looked about uh, 20 different rivers in Norway to look uh, to see if there were um, evidence of genetic integration from pardon fish, and they found it in all uh, 20 rivers. So the, um, the effects of the wild fish, uh, if they escape, can lead to three different scenarios. The spread scenario, the purge scenario, and the thorium gene scenario, and I will go through them now. So the spread, we start with the spread scenario. Here we have our transgenic fish or farmed fish, and here we have our wild fish or native fish. So let's see that our um, let's say that our handsome farmed fish meets the wild population and is allowed to breed. So if, um, if the next generation has beneficial traits and it is also allowed to breed, these uh, traits, these farm traits will spread into the population until it is a part of the whole population. And this uh, occurs um, if the, if the genetically modified fish is fitter uh, than its um, uh, counterparts and is allowed to breed. And the opposite is the purge scenario where you have our, uh, our wild fish, uh, no, our farmed fish that meets the wild fish. But if the local fish are fitter, so even though they are allowed to mate, uh, if the offspring is less fit than the wild population, it, uh, these genes, the farmed genes, will be purged out of the population. And third, you have a more um, um, devastating scenario, but it's also uh, less likely, but it can happen. And then that happens if you have our beautiful, handsome fish that is mating uh, and you get offspring. But if the offspring is somehow less fit, but they are still allowed to mate. So then it's if the genetically modified fish seem fitter, like it's large and beautiful, and so it gets mating, but it has some sort of flaw, for instance, that it's poorly adapted to a specific river or uh, that the adults have poor uh, viability or something. This, it will spread its genes to, um, to a generations that will 
eventually become less and less viable and uh, eventually die out and the population will go extinct. And this uh, is especially worrisome in Norway, where you have several hundreds uh, of these salmon rivers and the population in each of these rivers are adapted to these individual rivers. And maybe the farm fish who has never um, uh, had to hunt or such uh, maybe can lead to this devastating scenario. Uh, another um, negative effect of the um, escapees is the other effects on the ecosystems because they can, for instance, even though they don't mate, for instance, they can compete for resources and they can predate on local populations. And so they can still affect wildlife even though they do not mate. One solution to the escape is, is to keep them on land. And another is to make them sterile. Uh, even though sterile fish cannot lead to the um, uh, to the um, genetic integration, they can still have these effects on the wildlife. But I want to talk a little bit about producing sterile fish because it can take care of two of the largest problems in aquaculture and not just the the um, escapees, but one is the early sexual maturation that I uh, was talking about with um, that uh, leads to risk of diseases and low flesh quality and increased mortality and, and genetic pollution, etc. And the other is, of course, the genetic interaction with wild fish in the escapees. So then you will not have the hybrid fish. So there can be a lot of uh, advantages to producing sterile fish. And I want to talk a little bit about some methods used to um, induce sterility in fish or that has the potential to do it. First, I would like to talk about triploid fish. So a normal fish is diploid with uh, two sets of chromosomes, uh, one from the father and one from the mother, whereas a triploid has a double set from the mother. And the way that it, it's produced is that um, the fertilized egg is exposed to a pressure shock, and this prevents the extrusion of the second polar body that would normally occur after fertilization and it leads to a retention of it, creating a triploid uh, um, zygote, or in the embryo. And uh, this has proved to be very effective, uh, while even though it's not maybe not 100% effective, because some studies suggest that like 1% of the males can uh, fertilize eggs, but the, um, the offspring seldom the offspring seldom grows up, so there is a small chance of spread, but there is a, a, a slight chance though. Um, though, but it there has been health problems uh, reported with the triplet fish, and that is lower body weight at harvest, uh, which they think is. Um, is caused by a shorter intestine and also more gut microbes and smaller olfactory bulbs. And these smaller olfactory bulbs may uh, may indicate that the, the, the fish have problems finding food or that they uh, have less effective feeding behavior. And they also there are also skeletal uh, problems. And you see uh, here a normal neck, and here you see a triploid curved neck, and also in the in the spine, and also heart problems uh, have been reported. So that is a lot of uh, animal welfare issues connected to this uh, triploid fish, even though it's um, very effective. 
but it seems that new knowledge about the triploid fish uh, and their physiology have been obtained. And uh, so it might be that these problems uh, can be sorted out for the future. Uh, uh, there is also been uh, induced uh, sterility using CRISPR in the last few years. And when you want to create genetically sterile fish, you first you have to find uh, the genes that cause fertility. But now you have a lot of species with their, with their genomes sequenced. So it's more possible. So everything happens faster now. And now you also have the method to do something about it when you find those genes. So uh, what you have to do is that you first have to target genes for uh, fertility. And there was this group that uh, uh, made a knockout of the dead end gene, which is a factor required for germ cell survival in all vertebrates. And they coupled this with a target for a pigmentation gene. And by doing that, the knockout individuals could be identified phenotypically, uh, while um, single allelic knockouts would have a mosaic pattern, the double um, knockouts would lack pigmentation altogether. And by use of CRISPR-Cas, uh, these um, this group made a hundred percent knockout and producing completely sterile fish without germ cells, because this dead end gene uh, it's is needed for germ cell uh, to to survive. So here you have the one year old fish. Here you have uh, the normal fish, and here you have the the knockout fish. And you see here in the in the female, here you see large oocytes, uh, but in the knockout female, you only see somatic cells. And in the male, here you see spermatogonia dividing inside the testes, whereas in the knockout male, you can only see uh, Sertoli and Leydig cells. Um, so this was achieved already in the F0 generation, uh, which is, it can save a lot of time because uh, Salman has a generational time of three years. So it takes a lot of time to produce a generation of double allelic mutation by breeding if you only have a single allelic mutation to start with. But CRISPR's, uh, CRISPR can change this and can create double allelic mutations already in the F0 uh, generation. However, there were some disadvantages to this or, or some negative effects that were, were spotted and that it was that the ovarian uh, compartment in the mutant fish seemed disorganized. Uh, but it's not known if this is a welfare problem for the fish. So that is, um, uh, uh, the future will show, I guess. Anyway, this is a, a promising tool to create sterile fish, and it, but, but this is quite new technology as of yet, and we have to follow the fish to see if they have more problem or if this is a, a good way to do it. As mentioned earlier, there, one of the largest problems in aquaculture is um, that of animal welfare. And there are... Um, many aspects of welfare issues in the aquaculture with stress and handling and crowding and not being able to live naturally and, and so on. But uh, here I would like to focus on diseases and parasites, um, which are huge threats to sustainable aquaculture production. So far, there has been um, no geno uh, genomic editing related to diseases in fish. And that is uh, probably because little is known about the functional genes and the variants underlying genetic resistance to disease. But as we now have um, sequenced a lot of the genomes and uh, technology is moving forward fast, we will likely be able to identify some of these um, in the future. And there are some that have been identified already such as that for infectious pancreatic necrosis virus. And the fish that have the IPNV 
uh, they have uh, up, uh, swelling in, in the abdomen and and large spleen, and it can lead to high mortality. And uh, even though it hasn't been performed in fish yet, there is uh, there's been performed in in for instance pigs where you have resistance to porcine reproductive and respiratory syndrome that was achieved by CRISPR. So this may be promising for the future. Uh, I would like to present an area that has a high need for such tools, and that is one of the biggest challenges in Norwegian aquaculture, and that is what uh, that of the salmon louse. Uh, salmon louse is a copepod sea louse that lives mostly on salmon and any increase in salmon production in the sea is currently hindered uh, by the high pro prevalence of this parasite. Um, it feeds uh, on the mucus and the skin and the blood of, uh, of the salmon and by eating the skin and the mucus and blood the fish uh, get injured uh, get gets uh, injured and this makes it more the fish more susceptible for other infections such as uh, bacteria and virus and fungi and and it can also affect its uh, osmoregulatory capacities so it's quite uh, devastating it leads to high mortality and um, yeah not good and uh, in the salmon louse it, it um, it's carried in the sea like a plankton. And because, because there are many hosts inside a sea pen, uh, the sea louse can proliferate quickly. And also then it can spread from the sea pens to the wild populations. And there is an interesting project going on now uh, in Nofema where they will compare the Pacific salmon to the um, to the Atlantic salmon because the Pacific salmon seems less susceptible to sea lice so by trying to identify which factors make Atlantic, silma, uh, Atlantic salmon so attractive if there are certain chemicals released from the skin for instance and uh, that the sea louse is attracted to you could try to knock out those genes with CRISPRs for instance as for now, we use the cleaner fish, and there is many problems associated with cleaner fish too, and the aquaculture of these species. There are high mortality, and there are sickness, and low animal welfare. So it uh, will be very exciting to see if Nofema comes up with something interesting. And other areas of interest for GM, I thought for a genetic modification, I thought I'd just sum up a little bit. It has um, uh, it has great potential to improve the health and welfare of fish, and hence also reduce the use of antibiotics and other medications, which will also be good for the environment. Uh, and it can. Um, uh, maybe a lead to increased stress resistance and uh, which will of course also lead to um, a positive economic um, effect which will give more meat and less veterinary interventions and so on and also uh, as I mentioned earlier there may be there are many people that are allergic to seafood so uh, it's also possible through genetic modifications to maybe knock out those genes that cause allergy in humans and then produce allergy-free fish. The last subject I want to talk about uh, for the challenges in aquaculture is that of the fish feed. As I mentioned that uh, food for carnivore species, they put pressure on wild stocks used to supply fish meal and fish oil. And that can lead to overfishing and um, and, uh, and um, reduce um, biodiversity and uh, affect wild stocks of fish. 
so there has been um, uh, one has tried to find alternatives to the um, the fish fish meal for instance uh, soy and uh, while soy can be an alternative source for protein as a replacement for part of the fish meal the production and demand for soy has had a negative impact um, on the environment such as deforestation of the rainforest and furthermore for instance uh, soybean meal is linked to inflammations of the intestine and this is a, an animal welfare problem of course and um, and also feed that are, are poorly digested would digested would result in limited growth and also more feces that will be released to the uh, to the environment and pollute so could uh, genetic modifications make the fish more adapted would that increase animal welfare could it help the environment these are very interesting topics for um, for future research both for the fish themselves and to create more nutritious food and uh, to prevent uh, 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 over exploitation of the wild stocks so by feeding the the, um, the fish a lot of, of vegetable oils uh, and instead of um, fish meal it could affect their nutrition um, Atlantic salmon is an important source for omega-3 and these these acid uh, the omega-3 acids are known to reduce uh, incidences of cardiovascular diseases and inflammatory disorders and neurological pathologic, uh, pathologies in humans, for instance. And when Atlantic salmon in aquaculture are increasingly fed with vegetable oils, uh, they contain less of these desired um, fatty acid or less of omega-3. So there was this uh, group that tested that if a knockout of the genes in the fatty acid elongation pathway uh, could alter the ability of salmon to produce this acid themselves uh, and they can uh, so uh, this means that uh, genetic modification has the possibility to uh, make the fish convert food to a great even greater efficiency and this can lead to more nutritious food even though uh, even with less nutritious uh, food for them or feed. The last topic I'm going to talk about is public concern. If you do a, a quick Google search on genetic modified organisms, then these will show up. Many people are scared of genetic modified um, organisms and will not eat plant or meat that are genetically modified. So this is what many people think of when they think of a genetically modified fish. And the reason why many fear the GMO is, uh, um, is that they, they think that them, they themselves will be genetically modified by eating genetically modified organisms. And also they fear that if we agree to, to modified food, then we agreed to modify humans eventually. And uh, that being a natural human with flaws um, and so on will no longer suffice. And some fear the whole technology in itself. So they fear that by, and that by uh, accepting these technologies and allowing improvements of these technologies, then it can be used to make biological weapons and so on. And some of these concerns may be very well real, while others may be the results of too little knowledge on the matter. But if the public do not want to eat um, the genetically modified organisms, then this is just a waste of resources. So we also need to take that into account. And one of the um, arguments against 
genetic modified um, genetic modification is that scientists are playing God. And one of the arguments is that uh, everything unnatural is unethical. And they say that natural uh, is better, which is quite of a, a romantic understanding of the world. Is, of course, there are many natural things that are decisively not good. For instance, um, cyanide. And um, much of the developed world is, is urban and, and unaware of farming techniques. The, um, the industrial reality of, uh, for example, chicken broiler birds that have been selectively bred to a size that they cannot walk normally, um, that is, uh, they will buy the broiler chicken, though. So it's very, it's a discussion that, um, that needs to be had and, and uh, knowledge needs to be, we as scientists have a, have a um, we need to, need to help uh, increase the public knowledge so that they understand what they, what they, what they eat. Uh, it seems that, um, so it seems that the public separate selective breathing from genetically genetical engineering so they are willing to eat the broiler chicken but not the genetically modified chicken for instance but they also uh, some people also um, forget that uh, selective breathing has been used for many things for instance um, uh, breathing the dogs, as I mentioned uh, earlier, and that some dogs may suffer from the side effects from selective breathing. For instance, the, the pug has breathing problems. And um, so there can be many negative effects from, from selective breathing as well. So we need to have a... Um, um, a more clear discussion about this because selective breathing is not really that different from genetically engineering in terms of playing God except that it's much faster and genetically and engin genetical engineering is cheaper and more precise so yeah and another thing that the public seems to separate is food fish from laboratory fish because genetically modified organisms or fish is used extensively in research and the public seem to be milder toward, towards this. Um, of course, there are uh, quite strong voices against the use of animal uh, in research in general. Uh, it, there still seem to be, um, to be more okay with this uh, than for food themselves which is probably connected to that fear, maybe, of becoming genetically modified themselves by eating genetically modified food. There are some ethical uh, aspects, of course, that we should talk about. And that is, for instance, that which is an economical advantage tends not to be an environmental advantage or an animal welfare advantage. And since aquaculture is a uh, big business, there, there is, for instance, lobbying to bend rules and get leg legislation and permissions to do questionable things. And this may press the ethical boundaries concerning, concerning animal welfare and the risk of escapees and pollutions in the fjords and so on. Um, and also there are such that Different countries have different rules, and but it doesn't matter if one country allows it and another country does if you have escapees, because if it escapes into the sea, then it's all of us that has the problem. And the last thing is intellectual property and patents. And while the, um, the ethics of animals uh, as entities uh, that can be patented, 
patented uh, is uh, in itself questionable. Uh, it is so that fish farmers, they cannot use the technology or, or, or breed the fish uh, that has, has been created through genetic modification. For instance, the aqua advantage they hold, um, hold the pattern in Norway and the aqua bounty has a monopoly over this technology. And this can be a disadvantage, for instance, to developing countries where a genetically modified aquaculture industry may have a detrimental effect on conventional aquaculture farmers and fishes or wild salmon because they cannot compete and they cannot use the technology. To sum up, I just want to say uh, um, this is what could be great if everything works as we would want it to. Then we could create a fish that is healthy and happy, that grows fast, that is allergen free, nutritious meat, who needs less resources, has little need for chemical use, is sterile and is on land. Then we are safe and we get a happy fish that is healthy and it creates uh, less uh, demand on the environment. The worst case scenario, however, is if we create a large and fast growing fish that is not happy with health issues in need of medication, create lots of waste, but who is handsome and fertile is in the sea and is poorly regulated. Because if it's handsome and fertile, if it escapes and is poorly regulated, then it can spread its genes through genetic introgression. And if the fish is not happy, then you have poor animal welfare. So that is horrible. To sum up the pros and cons of the genetically modified salmon, no fish in aquaculture is that uh, on the positive note, it can give more meat for less feed and less time, which can feed more people and save uh, resources. So it has the potential to spare the environment and uh, with the world's rapidly expanding population, it is important to provide safe and nutritious fish. And it can reduce the genetic integration of escapees by creating sterile fish. It can reduce medications, increase disease resistance and increase medical, no, animal welfare. And create more uh, nutritious meat and drive technological uh, advantages. So the science on the of the curing of diseases, for example, it might be beneficial for other animals or plants or humans. Maybe create uh, new antibiotics or produce allergen free food, etc. And the disadvantages are the off target effects and the animal welfare issues, um, public concern and commercial impact the ethical concerns, and of course, the escapees and the environmental impact. So uh, my take home message is that short run advantages of genetic modification may prove detrimental, if not handled with care. It's a very promising field and it may give us a lot of great benefits, but we have to uh, be smart about it and regulate it. Last slide is that I just want to show you that the genes are being identified and fries are being made and there's lots of science coming uh, going on. And so this is coming and we must be prepared. We need to have our risk assessment in place and careful plans. Then maybe this new technologies can be great news for the future. Thank you so much for your attention. My name is Christine von Krog and I'm a phys physiologist. And this is um, my group leader, Roma Fontan, and the head of the department and the supervisor to my PhD, Finana Veltzin. Thanks so much. <laughs>